What should faith formation and religious ed- education at the parish level and at the diocesan level look like? And how do we equip parents and young people and children with the tools to know and share and keep the faith? <laughs> That's a big and important topic that Bishop Caggiano is going to dive deeply into with the help of a special guest today. Patrick Donovan heads up the Institute for Catholic Formation, formerly known as the Leadership Institute, here in the Diocese of Bridgeport. He's on Let Me Be Frank today. And this is important. So keep your radio here at 1350 AM or keep listening on the Veritas app on your phone. If you don't yet have the app, download it at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or at VeritasCatholic.com. And we are very grateful to Foundations in Faith for sponsoring Let Me Be Frank. It's that time of year again. Foundations in Faith is now accepting applications for Youth in Action grants. The program will fund three diocesan initiatives that are by youth and for youth for up to $5,000. To be eligible, applicants must be members of a Catholic high school, a parish high school aged youth group, or a Catholic young adult group. Applications must also emphasize evangelization, collaboration, or justice and equity for historically underserved populations in their proposed programs. You can find out more on the Foundations in Faith website, where applications are now live, and they will be live until they close on November 19th at midnight. So to learn more or to apply, visit foundationsinfaith.org and click on Youth in Action Grants at the top of the page Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport, from seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities. The reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. All right, I'm Steve Lee, and it is my pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, how are you this week? How have you been this week? Uh, It's... uh... It's been a, um, a long fall, <laughs> but hasn't it? Uh, <laughs> but it's it been has, great. At least the fall has come finally. Yes, it's yep. cooled off, right? Yep. And the colors on the merit are beautiful. I mean, finally, we may not have a long fall, but at least we've got one. Thank you. Yes. God. Yep. Yep. And I and I never want to complain because I'm here. My wife and kids still love me. I got Jesus. I'm talking to Is you. He- that's what, well, if you count on one of your blessings, I pray for you. <laughs> but the point is, see, that's why you're a holy man and I'm not. Because complaining for me is cathartic. It's like private therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. We should, uh, <laughs> well, let, let me anyway. uh, take, so we have a, a great guest with us today. And so I'll take a minute and introduce Patrick Donovan. Now, Patrick Donovan has been a teacher, a retreat leader, a workshop presenter, diocesan director of youth and young adult ministry, and now he serves as the diocese. Of, he serves the diocese of Bridgeport as the director of the Leadership Institute. And uh, in addition to his day job doing that, uh, he has authored or co-authored four books, more than fifty articles. He's an adjunct faculty member at Sacred Heart University, and uh, Excellency, he's really smart. He has a degree uh, in communications from the University of Tennessee, a master's in theology from Notre Dame, and a doctorate in theology from LaSalle. Yeah, no, I, I know how competent Patrick is. I have the, the privilege of working with him here in the Chancery, right? As yes. we try to reimagine faith formation. So, Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. So, so Patrick, listen, um, we know each other very well, and we work so, you know, so, so, so closely on so many different initiatives, and there's much we can talk about. But why don't we just start by just asking the generic question. Um, in our diocese, when I go around, it, and I hear this from the mouths of clergy and laity, you will hear things like, oh, in our parish, we have faith formation. In my parish, we have religious education. In my parish, we have CCD. Like, what... What are they talking about? What is all of this? How do you make sense of all of this? What, what, what is the topic at hand? How would you describe it? Well, it's interesting that you say that there's so many different titles. I have to laugh when Steve did the introduction because I clearly haven't updated that introduction because there is no more Leadership Institute. We've even changed uh, the language here in the diocese to the Institute for Catholic Formation. Um, 
so I think part of Bishop, what we're talking about is how do we pass on the faith to our young people? How do we help parents? How do we accompany parents in their role as witnesses and storytellers? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as the new directory of catechesis says, the keeper of the memory of God, which is such a beautiful image and something I think parents and catechists uh, and young people struggle with. How are we keepers of the memory of God? So it's called lots of different things in lots of different places, but at the end of the day, it's all about sharing the faith with others, accompanying young people on their journey of discovery of who they are as children of God and how they fit into salvation history. So then, Patrick, what's the landscape look like in the world of formation? What do you see as bright spots, opportunities, challenges, obstacles? Give us what you see. Well, I think first and foremost, I would be remiss if I didn't point out and thank, and I know you join me in this, Bishop, all of those catechists and directors and coordinators of religious education who strive every single day to, to make faith formation happen, especially those who did so much during the pandemic and are still doing it. You know, we talk about this great pivot that we did with our schools and with our workplaces, but we forget that the parishes had to do it too, and not just with online mass or online collections or whatever, but how did we make this pivot with faith formation uh, in our parishes? And so many of them, you know, we went from probably 2,200 catechists down to 1,100 uh, in the course of a year, almost overnight. Uh, where people, for a while, lots of different reasons, stopped volunteering or, or, or were unable to fulfill that role. So really, my hat's off to the catechists who, who are with us and the directors and coordinators of religious education. Um, that being said, I think the landscape is one of hope and one of one that is becoming more and more clear as we move forward because we have realized through the study and through the research that what we were doing and what we have been doing for really generations wasn't working. And when I say it wasn't working, I know that can sound harsh to those who spent so many years teaching the faith, but we all know that young people are leaving the church. St. Mary's Press, in their study, Going, Going, Gone, tells us that the median age of disaffiliation is 13. Well, the reason that that's happening is because we, one of the reasons, is because we did not inspire and engage and maintain a relationship. We, we, we treated faith formation as though it was transactional. You come to class, you finish the book, you're done. And it has to be transformational. It has to be built in relationship. It has to be rooted at home. It has to be part and parcel of a larger community and a more comprehensive approach to um, the parish life, the life of the parish. So, so I, I think we find ourselves at a crossroads right now. And, mm -hmm. and you and I have talked about sometimes the exhaustion that comes from being at a crossroad, but Mm -hmm. But I'm very hopeful because more and more people have stopped and stood around and said, maybe we could do better. Maybe right. we could do something differently. You right. know, Holy Father warns us of that trap of, in Evangelical Gaudium, he says that, you know, if you're in a parish, you should never utter the words, we've always done it this way. And we've been doing that for too long, I think, with faith formation. Mm -hmm. So I'm really mm -hmm. pleased that we're at a point now where we can look and say, mm -hmm. okay, how do we do this differently? How can we right. reimagine faith formation? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. In, the, in our work together in the diocese, for the benefit of the people who are listening to us today, uh, we have been working together, and I myself have been beating this drum now for a bit, is that when we reimagine anything, Right? It's not a wholesale reconstruction. It's a repositioning, right? It's, it's a recasting. You know, it's being able to make the passing on of the faith 
effective in the world in which we live. So we can't ignore the world in which we live as if it didn't matter, because it does matter. And if you remember when I met with the DREs, and I also, we, we met with the pastors of the diocese, and we talked about some of those fundamental issues we have to start thinking about, because in the end, it's the premises we operate out of that have to now be re-examined. So it's, it's we got to build a foundation strong enough so that we could build a house. Right. And some of those issues are going to provoke a lot of discussion. OK, so I'm going to give one and I'm going to I want you to react both as a professional, as a theologian and as a parent and as a spouse. OK, if you remember when I spoke about parents, you raised the issue and I gave them the choice between teacher and witness. And in the end, what is our expectation of parents in the enterprise of formation? Is it that they are the teachers of the faith in the language of the faith and the content of the faith? Is that their primary duty? Or is their primary duty to be a witness to the faith? That is to teach children to, to pray, to have them feel the love of God by the love that they give, which at times can be tough, to help them to create a habitus in the, in the family of a prayerfulness and awareness of God's presence. I'm not sure we all agree on the answer to just that one question that we have to come to terms with if we're going to rebuild the house. Why don't you comment on that or any of those other topics we had spoken about at that present? You started the presentation, if I, if I remember. So what do you think? You know, Bishop, for years, the, the rite of baptism had that beautiful prayer at the end, and I heard it four times myself. Um, the blessing over the Father was, you know, me... God bless the father of this child. Together with his wife, they are the first teachers in the ways of faith. May they be the best of teachers in what they say and what they do. And I remember the first time I heard that, I, I, there was a moment where I thought, God, this kid's in trouble. Because if they're <laughs> going to get it from me, I better make sure I know it. And, and I'm not sure 16 years ago, certainly I know him a lot more now than I did then. But it was this moment of realization that, yeah, it starts with me. It starts with me. But, but the problem with that is that for generations, we told parents, you are the first teachers of the ways of faith. Well, guess what? That's, first of all, it's incredibly intimidating. Second of all, if you don't know your faith, how in the world are you supposed to teach your children? And not just the practices, but the, but the practical and the, the doctrine and the dogma and, and, and all of the stuff that goes into it. So I'm so glad that the rite of baptism was updated. And of course, it got lost in the pandemic because as soon as it came out, we stopped doing baptisms because we, our churches had to close. But now the language is that, that moms and dads are the first witnesses of the faith. And I like that language so much better because there is a difference I think we can agree between between teaching the faith and setting a good example. I, I remember I tell the story and and I tell the story all the time. And I, in fact, I told it last night to a group of sophomores at Sacred Heart. We're talking about kinship and we're talking about we belong to each other and we're talking about um, we were reading from Father Greg Boyle's uh, book uh, Tattoos on the Heart, where he talks about um, standing in awe of the poor and what they carry rather than standing in judgment of how they carry it. And I tell the story of being in the car with, at that point, she was two years old and two and a half, and you've met my children, they're, they, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> so this, there's a homeless man at the end of the street, the exit ramp from the interstate, and I switch lanes. And I don't wanna stop next to the homeless man. I moved over. And the voice from the back of the seat, back of the, the, the van is, really, really, Dad? You've got nothing to give him? And I, you know, in that moment, I felt so incredibly small and humiliated and, and disappointed in myself because in that moment, I taught her not to care for the person who was on the other end of the, mm -hmm. the window mm -hmm. of the street. I, I, and I and I keep I go back to that all the time because you better believe it changed the way that I I drive and it changes the way that I um, behave in a car when um, there's somebody in need on the outside. But but my point is that's witnessing. 
-hmm. that's that and it's not witnessing well i mean I, I fail miserably but but that's what it means to witness to the faith i can mm -hmm. teach my child the ten commandments i can teach my child the beatitudes i can teach my child what happens on all souls day and who mary is in relationship to salvation history but if i don't witness the faith at home if i don't show them in what i say and in what i do then this god that i speak of as love is just a myth to them right it's just exactly. foreign right. because they right. don't see it in action mm -hmm. Right. So I think the ch and I don't and from that day to this I've made lots and lots of mistakes, but but I I think part of our challenge is um, is understanding what it means to be a witness. I, I think we have to remember it's the church's job to teach the faith. We we we've, we've got structures set up for that. We don't always do a great job, but we're working on it. But it's mom and dad's job from day one to witness the faith. You know, young people learn to pray when they see mom and dad learn to pray, or, or praying. Mom and, you know, young people learn to read the Bible when mom and dad read the Bible. Young people learn to be nice to one another when they see mom and dad in a loving, committed relationship, right. caring for one another and caring for the people that they meet. Right. So and I'm going to add one more, you know, Patrick. May I just interrupt? Go ahead. Before you, before you leave your litany, one more. <laughs> and this, in my mind, is fundamental since love is not a concept you learn, but is a mystery that you experience, that the fundamental way a parent witnesses to the faith is by finding ways in the crazy mixed up world in which we live to effectively love their children. Because yes. in the experience of being loved by parents and siblings, an extended family, and could I even dare say your parish family, mm -hmm. you can actually trust what you just said, that this God who I cannot see could love me. Right. And it, without that experience, without that encounter, you and I have talked about all clergy, we've been talking about an encounter with God for a generation. If that doesn't happen, then everything we're going to talk about for the rest of this hour is academic. And it's not academic. It's meant to be formational, right? And in a sense, by calling a parent not a teacher but a witness, it seems as if you're taking them off the hook. But in effect, they have the most sacred duty of all. Right. It's right? harder, actually. Exactly. It's harder. I can, you know, a, teaching, I mean, and now my kids are older, so last night it was all about geometry, which I don't understand either. But... Um, it's about helping young people when we talk about love and we talk about God is love. When you ask a group of teenagers, by and large, to describe who God is, I'm not sure that, that they, unless they know scripture, unless they've been really well formed, I'm not sure their default answer is going to be God is love. They're going to say God is forgiving, God is merciful, God is, they're going to, they're going to talk about aspects of love. They're going to talk about what love looks like, but only if they've also experienced that love. And I, you know, I tell my kids all the time, love is a helium-based emotion. Love should lift you up. It doesn't, it, 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 it is not in love's interest for your self-esteem to be low. Love never laughs yeah. at you. Love never hits you. Love never, you know, makes you do what they want. Love, love builds you up. Love, and love doesn't even ask you to change. But if you change, love goes right along with you. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about a sinful change. I'm talking about all the things that kids struggle with in terms of body image and psychosexuality and gender issues and all that. Love goes right along with you because that's, that's what love is. Um, uh, go ahead. May I just share a story? Um, let me share a story. Yesterday I had a conversation with a, a young man. And he was talking about pride. Right? and how he has to work on pride in his life. And in the conversation, I intuited something a bit different. And I said, yes, you need to surrender your pride to God. But I said, but let me ask you a question. If you stood before a mirror and asked yourself the question, does God love what I'm looking at? How would you answer the question? Hmm. 
and there was just silence. Because in the end, to your point, the fundamental insight of Jesus's ministry is that there is a moment where there's recognition that I, Bartimaeus, uh, Jairus' daughter, uh, Peter and James and John, and everybody in between, Mary Magdala, the scribes, the Pharisees, they had a moment that I am not junk, that I am worth the full attention of this extraordinary rabbi, that I may be worth it after all. Okay, that's when love breaks in. Then to your point, our task is to invite them further into that mystery because that mystery has a grammar, a structure, right? And that's what we call the, do that's what we call the doctrines of the faith. It's the mystery of who is loving us and what he asks of us in mission. So if we have a fundamental issue in my mind, and push back if you disagree, Steve also, when you have an opportunity, you can chime in, disagree. If we have a fundamental um, challenge in the 21st century is to allow our young people and all people to believe that God does not believe they are junk, but they are precious and beloved to him. And he wants to walk with them, just like you said. And if we don't do that one-to-one, -one, personally, in formation, in relationship, then a, no textbook is gonna do that. Why, am, I, am I off base? <laughs> no, but I think there's another piece to it. I think there is, um, and you've said this before, so I'm quoting yourself back to yourself, but um, I think it's easy for young people to believe that they are loved. I'm not mm -hmm. always sure it's easy for young people to believe that they are lovable. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. And, there's, and I think there's a difference there. I think... Yes, yes. I think the challenge... Mm -hmm. You know, and go using the example that you just used, Bart, Bartimaeus, I always... Every time that story is told, I, I just love the story because I can imagine Jesus with his followers, and we know from the beginning of the story that Bartimaeus is blind. And we know that... you know We know, we know that, you know, the, the winners write the history books. We know how this is going to end. Bartimaeus is probably going to get to see at the end of this story. But it's it's not an easy journey for Bartimaeus. You bring him forward. Well, how does somebody's got to bring him forward because he's blind? But then there's that that there's that scene where, um, where they where Jesus says, "What is it that you What is it that you seek? What do you desire? What do you want?" And I got to imagine because I just I I love Peter, and I got to imagine Peter just kind of slaps his forehead. It's like, dude, he's blind. You really got to ask. And yes, because for me. That whole story is about naming your needs before God. It's about going to somebody bigger and better and higher and more powerful and more loving and more forgiving and more merciful than I will probably ever be, certainly, and, and naming my needs. And that's prayer. And that, I think, is one of the things young people struggle with so much is creating a relationship with God where they name their needs where right. they are in conversation. Right. And once mm -hmm. Bartimaeus is able to name his needs, I mm -hmm. want to see. Well, then he can throw his cloak off and follow Jesus. Then everything right. is right. bright, right. new, and, and clear. But we have to help young people. We have to help parents help young people name their needs. And, and what I find fascinating about Bartimaeus is that he was not afraid to recognize that he had the need. In other words, he didn't fall into the trap of thinking you have to be perfect in order to be lovable. Right. And he kept persisting, even though the apostles wanted him to be quiet. He right. kept persisting and was comfortable yes. to tell the whole world he was blind because yes. he knew even if he was not cured, this Jesus, he knew that he was worth this Jesus' time and Jesus would respond if only Jesus could hear what he was saying, which he did. So, so in the end, I think that's right on the money. And part of, of the culture wars that are going on in the church, if I could call them that, between, you know, how do we do this? Is it all about doctrine? Is it all about service? Is it all about prayer and spirituality? 
you know, in, in my mind, it's all of it. It's not just this or this or this, it's all of it, but the foundation has got to be that I am lovable and I believe that there is someone who loves me. And then I'm willing to now go the next step. So right. it sounds so fundamental, right, Patrick? That it, it almost sounds as if, well, you know, you're stating the obvious. But if you look at the landscape and the littered landscape of the modern world, um, it may be obvious, it may be basic, but I'm not sure it's happening. <laughs> and then, so no, I think well, we happening. reimagine faith formation, right? <laughs> this is what we have to begin, right? I, you're right. And I think if it were happening, Generation Z would not identify as the loneliest generation in the world. Or uh, in in history, I mean, that's what the stat that's what the stats tell us. That's what the that's what Generation Z is telling us, that they and knowing that there's a difference between loneliness and being alone, I get that. Mm -hmm. But but all the research points to this rise in anxiety, this rise. Sure, I got a hundred thousand friends on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and everything else, but I'm lonely, mm -hmm. and and because they're not they're not connected, they're not. And and we could have a whole podcast, and I'm sure you have or you will at some point about the effects of technology on kids oh, and on all of us. Oh, yeah, we're coming to that, boss. After, I mean, our, uh, oh. after our break, that's the next topic I'm going to throw at you. Oh, yeah. Oh, technology Lord. and faith formation. <laughs> yeah. I let's, let's, uh, this is a good, sp uh, good spot then for us to take a break. Um, you're listening to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. Patrick Donovan is on with us to talk about faith formation for parents, for young people at the parish and diocesan levels, really at the, at the family level. Um, stay right there. We will be right back with more. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Such an important conversation that uh, His Excellency is having with Patrick Donovan and about to take a really important turn, uh, even more important. Um, Excellency, you were about to ask yes. Patrick about technology. Oh yes, so let's let's take let's take the 800 pound gorilla and put him right in the middle of our conversation, right? And I've spoken about this many times, so I want to hear your thoughts, Patrick. And we've spoken about it privately in our curial meetings. But technology and faith formation, um, in many ways, when the pandemic struck, it was the lifeline to allow us to remain connected in some way. Right. Um, it was not the ideal, but it was certainly better than total disconnection. And I think our catechists, our school teachers, our parents did a great job. Right. And it's a great way to keep the information flowing. But now, please, God, we're coming out of the pandemic and we have this tool. So talk to us about its advantages. Talk about its opportunities. Talk about some of the difficulties that could arise. What, from your perspective, as you look at the faith formation in our diocese, if we're going to reimagine, what role does technology play? Big one, small one, medium one? How? The, the, the floor is yours. Talk to us about this. 
Well, I do think that, I think technology obviously has a place. I think that um, it is easy for us to become dependent on technology um, in the last year to 18 months. It is easier to Zoom than it is to actually have a conversation with people. Um, it's easier to work from home than it is actually to put pants on and go to the office. And there is a complacency, I think, that sets in with all of that. Um, it, even email, I, I, how easy, it's so much easier to just fire off, you know, it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to somebody. And we get caught in this, um, this trap, I think, of just depending on technology. So, so from a faith formation standpoint, yes, we have to use technology. Yes, we have to make things available in different ways. But nothing beats relationship and nothing beats community and nothing beats that one-on-one. -on -one. I, I remember telling somebody I was working with, uh, I was challenging a, 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 somebody I was supervising. You know, I said email is the third worst form of communication. So if you need to get your message across, you're going to need to knock on some doors because face-to-face -face is best. Telephone is next, email is third, and fourth is texting. And, and it's easy for us to fall back on that. But I think part of what we have to understand is that nothing, nothing substitutes for relationship, for face-to-face, mm -hmm. in-person relationships. So, so I think first and foremost, we have to make this, we have to make this pivot backwards, if you will, towards the days when we actually did everything face to face. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we don't continue to stream mass online for those who um, cannot legitimately come back um, to celebrate with the community. Um, but even that, we have to acknowledge that that lacks a connection with people uh, and certainly a connection with the Eucharist. I think the biggest thing we have to keep in mind is we have to help parents because if parents are the first witnesses and 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 they don't know their faith and remember now we've got this whole generation of young people whose parents are the nuns the n-o-n-e-s's and if they identified as nuns growing up and now they're raising children well now we have a problem how do we help them navigate technology in a way that it doesn't become a hindrance to communication and a hindrance to family time and a hindrance to just the family meal and and instead a tool that could be used to help right foster right. communication help right. foster family activity help i mean right for instance one of the things that we've had great success with certainly is this podcast as a as a diocese and certainly you bishop but but the the um the institutes had some really great um success with the family bible challenge and that i think is a great use of technology it's seasonal the next one starts i think in just a week or so um and we focus on a theme for about six weeks and every sunday they get a reflection and a couple of questions and then they get a quiz on wednesday to kind of test their knowledge of um, general Catholic knowledge, but also the reading of the week. Well, that's going out to thousands and thousands of people. The face of prayer that, that, that we send out in your name every single day at about three o'clock goes out by text, and we've sent more than 10 million prayers to people literally all over the world. That's a great use of technology. And you and, you and I both talked to people who have said, mm -hmm. you know, I was fighting with my husband and the text came in, and it says, let's be the first to forgive. Well, it's hard to scream at him when that's the prayer I just said. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I love it when people say to me, you know, the, the prayer the other day was, um, let us pray today for those who annoy us. And somebody texted me and said, I wonder, I wonder if you were thinking of me when you wrote that prayer. And somebody else said, how did you know that was in my head when you were... I mean, and what I love about those stories is they still stopped and prayed. They still, you know, we right. laugh about it, we joke about right. it, but, but 10 million times we've done this with the face of prayer, mm -hmm. which is a great mm -hmm. use of technology. But if it's the mm -hmm. only way we pray, then we have a problem. 
Right. You know how I, I allow me one observation and one suggestion. This is the observation. I don't remember. It's been such a long time when I read this. So I don't remember what the citation was, but it left such a profound impact on me. I want to share it now to show the limits of technology. In this article that I read, it said, it claimed that an infant who could be fed, who could be sung with and sung to, who can be cared for in the crib, if that little infant doesn't have the experience of human touch, doesn't feel the warmth of, uh, of, of a person, mother, father, whoever that may be, that child could easily die. Mm. Even though their physical needs have all been met. And ever since then, I thought to myself, that's what we're talking about. That's the limit of technology. I cannot reach out and touch you, okay? Or anyone else listening. So it's a bridge, but it's not the destination. Right. Right? So that's one. And the second is, um, and, and this is something that just, it's been percolating in my mind, Patrick, since Brian came on the show last week. I thought his conversation is inside. The fact that he is a, 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 um, he's trained as a cook, or as, a, as a gourmet chef, just so fascinated me because could it be coming out of the pandemic that if we want to reimagine faith formation, one of the things we could challenge our parishes to do is monthly, bi-monthly, seasonally, have a meal with our young people and their parents and our catechists. Bring them together and have an evening meal and have some sort of catechesis and an experience of prayer. And the eating together creates the formational experience, which... 100,000 years ago, 50 years ago, would have been common in most households that a family ate together. Now it's intentional, and they start, they try to do that. Well, maybe as a faith formation community, we have to start being intentional and say, we're going to do our catechesis, and we're all going to break bread together to do it, and then we're going to pray together. What do you think of something like that? Is that sound like a crazy idea? No, not at all. It reminds me, actually, um, I don't... It, Remember when the movie um, Paul, Apostle of Christ came out? Oh, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And we invited people from all over the diocese to come to the theater. And mm -hmm. we filled the theater within about two or three days. And then we had to move it because of snowstorm. And everybody came out again. Great, again, great use of technology. But the Wall Street Journal, in doing a review, had this remarkable statistic. When Paul died in 67 or so, there were 2,500 Christians, mm -hmm. give or take. And that blows people's minds because they think, oh, he's written a letter to the Corinthians. There must be thousands of people in Corinth. No, he's writing to 15, 20, whatever. By 350, year, the year 350, there were 34 million mm -hmm. because they shared meals together, because they told stories together. Even in the midst of three waves of persecutions, they talked to each other. There was no technology, there was no Facebook, there was no Instagram. There just was the story. And by telling the Jesus story again and again and again, and by breaking bread with each other again and again and again, and by taking care of the most vulnerable again and again and again, the church grew by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And there's a part of me that thinks we've got to go back to the beginning. And and I and I love the image of I love the idea of sharing a meal with family. I would go one step further and say, leave your phones at the door. Oh, there's no technology here. There's just good conversation. There's yeah. just good family, and you know, eat with your own family. You can you know trade children if you want. I you know just get the parishes together to to share fellowship because what Pope Francis would call that is accompaniment. Right. And what the new director of catechesis would call it is accompaniment. And it says, you know, again and again and again, that accompaniment is not just a catechetical approach or a methodology. It's a way of being church. It's about building relationships based on respect, trust, and love. Mm -hmm. It's about evangelization mm -hmm. and catechesis. It's essential mm -hmm. 
to what we're trying to do. I agree. I agree. And I'm going to throw one more concept out there because, you know, for our listeners' sake, the fact that we're going to learn the doctrines of the church is a given. The fact that we're going to introduce our young people and and those converting into the faith and everybody else into a deeper understanding of the liturgical life and bringing them to Sunday Mass and allowing them, you know, to have some real, um, a, a, a real encounter with Christ that's beautiful and reverent, that Sunday Mass that can power them to go out into mission. So all of that is a given, right? Today we're talking about the premises underneath all of this that could make that happen more effectively, easier, with more widespread uh, fruit. The other concept I want to throw in is this. Everybody who's listened to this podcast has walked with me all this time, for which I'm deeply grateful, and I pray for all of you. You have heard me tell stories about my neighborhood growing up. Gosh, I don't know how many stories, and I still have hundreds more I could tell. But in the end, not using the word, what I was talking about, and still talk about, is not necessarily a neighborhood, but it is a community. And in a sense, what makes sense to me is that if we're going to reimagine faith formation, help young people and people encounter the love of Christ, pass on the language of the faith, share a meal together, then, this is the point, every parish has to become like an old time neighborhood where everyone knows your name, when when you are not there, you are missed. When someone struggle or bereavement or someone dies, it's not just, oh, I'm sorry, but it's a call, it's a visit, it's a prayer card, right? It's an offering of a mass, right? It, I was formed in the faith because an entire community helped to form, not just my parents and not just the priests and not just the sisters, and not, but my whole community formed me. Most of the time in a good way, sometimes by bad example. So talk to, me, talk to us, talk to me in particular, because this really excites me about how do we situate whatever we're going to do in a, in a parish that becomes, in my language, like a neighborhood again. What do you think? I think the first question you're going to get is, can we wear name tags at church? <laughs> and I, I don't think that's not, I don't think that's a bad idea. Um, when I lived in Delaware, um, our parish made a concerted effort to learn the names of young children. And so every child... And we did this through Sunday Mass, we did this through, through religious ed, through the school, etc. Every child put their name on an index card. And they were invited to call, they were called up, put the, you know, put your name down. So everybody could say, okay, oh, that's John, oh, that's Susie, oh, that's Katie, oh, that's, okay, good. And then eventually, those name tags slash index cards made their way to these wires, really. They just kind of draped all of these wires everywhere. Um so that they were on clothespins outside in the vestibule. And then eventually every adult was asked to take the name of a child or two or three and pray for them. But not until they learned who they were. And it was rooted in what a study had, that had been done at the time that said uh, that young people who are called by name, not a name, their name, by more than by five adults outside their family are three times more likely to stay involved in their faith. No matter what the faith is, this is cross denominational, cross generation. But if my children know that they have five adults that they can trust outside mom and dad. So when this whole thing was happening, we went through this exercise and because my children at the time did not like to share, we had to find 20 adults because they all wanted their own five. And and it's hilarious because there are, you know, and that was however many years ago. But I still have friends who are adults who call or text or check in on my children because they're one of their five. And, you know, and I love that image. I love that image. 
And that's, I think, part of what you're talking about is we need to, you know, for years and years and years growing up, there was this family in front of us at Mass, and then we just called them the beautiful family because they just were cut out of the catalog. They're just, they were just beautiful. And eventually the dad was missing for a little while. And we would talk about it on the way home, and we would say, I wonder what happened. I wonder if he's away. I wonder if he's unemployed. Da, 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 da. It, well, it turns out he was sick. But we never went two pews up and asked the question, how, where's dad? What's going on? What's your name? We just called them the beautiful family. And my guess is there's stories like that all over the diocese where people can mm -hmm. say, you know, oh, yeah, I know where they sit. I, I, that, oh, that guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's in the front row. Oh, that guy. Oh, you know, and at Christmas and Easter, there's somebody in my seat. But what we have to do, Bishop, I think, is, is you're right, start thinking of the parish as a neighborhood. You know, when I was a kid and I was driving the car and I was driving too fast, there was a lady down the street who would call before I ever got into my driveway. And so I would get in trouble because she called, I'll leave her name out of it since she still lives there. Um, she would have called my mother to report that Patrick was driving too fast. Be and it wasn't because she was a busybody. It was because she had a kid my age that she wanted somebody else to watch out for too. She genuinely right. cared about right. the safety of the kids in right. the neighborhood. Right, right, um, right, right. Not because she was just some old fuddy daddy who wanted right. to make calls and get right. kids in trouble. Right. So Although listen, that's, my friend. That's what I felt like at 16. <laughs> Yeah, um, just we have just a few minutes, I think. Um, I have spoken in the past about my desire to move the age of confirmation to the sixth grade in the diocese and to unveil a new revitalized youth ministry that would begin as the proximate preparation for confirmation and then accompany young people through their middle school years, high school years, and beyond. So in two minutes, Give us where we stand with that, what's the latest, um, so that people can understand it. Because for some people, it's kind of like, well, why are you lowering the age? Because we're going to lose these kids. So give us the latest update. So I think part of what we have to understand is that young people are... The, the studies show us that young people are leaving, they're disaffiliating earlier and earlier. And we want to get ahead of that. We want to make sure that young people are engaged and inspired at a very early age, from baptism through First Communion reconciliation, etc. That being said, we need to, you're right, it's a two-pronged approach. Confirmation should be a doorway into all sorts of opportunities for discipleship for young people in the neighborhood that is the parish community. Mm -hmm. We have to work with parishes. We need the cooperation of parishes and parish leaders to establish neighborhoods for young people, parishes that are in, intentionally reaching out to middle school and high school, offering a wide variety of discipleship opportunities for young people. At the same time, we're planning for confirmation down the line. Because what young people will say, what, what, what parish leaders often say is, well, if you move confirmation, they're just going to leave earlier. And the answer, my answer is, you're right, unless you give them a reason to stay. Because guess what? The reason they're leaving now is because there's no reason for them to stay. So what we have to do is intentionally spend the next year or so really reinventing youth ministry uh, in the Diocese of Bridgeport so that when that age moves there are all sorts of opportunities for young people. We've got to think a confirmation certificate, not as a diploma, but as a passport to all the opportunities that lay in front of a, chunk, a, a young person and their family. We've got to, right. you know, think of service not as countable hours, but as a way of life. We right. have to think of the parish, like you said, as a neighborhood. And now I get to be a leader in the neighborhood. Not that I'm finished learning, I have to, you know, in the same way, my oldest is now taking driver's ed. She's moved from the back seat to the front in, in all this time. When she's finished driver's ed, I pray to God she's not going to be finished learning 
how to drive. She's going to spend the rest of her life getting better and better and better. Right, right, right. Confirmation is the same add, thing. And if I may add one other thing too, which has now been percolating in my mind. You know, part of the difficulty that young that adults in our church have is that when they learn the faith, they were youngsters. Mm -hmm. and have never had an opportunity to relearn it and relearn it again in the different seasons of life. And part of what you and I will be working on with the pastors and our catechetical leaders is as we reimagine youth ministry and young adult ministry, we're also at the same time working on adult faith formation that should last your whole life because, you know what? To learn the resurrection of the Lord when you are in the second grade and to learn it in the sunset of your life when death is not far away and to understand the mystery is different. It's the same mystery, but another aspect of it comes to the fore. And whether you're talking about any of the doctrines of the church, you're going to understand it differently at 16 than you do at 46, that you'll do at 76 as you do at 6. Right. So we've said all along, it's, it's lifelong, it's ongoing, it's holistic. And the youth ministry part that you and I are working on is really not an abdication, like you said, but it's recognizing that we got to create the circumstances so that these young people can continue to learn how to pray, how to navigate the challenges they face in a hypersexualized world, right? That they have to that they also have to, in some way, shape, or form, be engaged in service that's proper to their age so that they're prepared to do it all over again when they're adults and all over again when they're middle-aged and all over again when they grow older, right? Is that a fair way of putting it? It is. I would say very, yes, absolutely. We need, and what we're working on, is a comprehensive plan for being in conversation about faith and religion with young people for as long as possible. And I mm -hmm. would add that confirmation can be part of that plan, but confirmation cannot be the plan. And that I think is the essential difference because I think yes, too many well of us, you know, we've talked about it, Bishop, about the sacrament is the ransom that young people pay. And that's not, that we just, it's, it's not what we want. It's not what parents want, I think, in their heart of hearts, but it's what we've been offering. And that's what we have to change. I agree. I agree. Gosh, this is such an important, conversation. I'm so glad I'm in the diocese where you both are spending so much time and effort, you know, really trying to put this in place. It's, uh, um, but we, we need to take a break. This is Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is speaking with Patrick Donovan, who heads up the Institute for Catholic Formation. Got it right that time which is here in the Diocese of Bridgeport. <laughs> uh, we'll be right back after the break so His Excellency can answer a listener question. Want to make a difference at work? Veritas Catholic Network is looking to hire a full-time development director. If you're organized and you have sales or fundraising experience, if you love the faith and feel called to evangelization, if you're looking for something more meaningful, email info at veritascatholic.com. We're hiring, and you can help take Veritas to the next level as we grow and continue to reach more and more souls with the incredible, saving words of Jesus Christ. Email us about the development director position. It's info at veritascatholic.com. That is info at veritascatholic.com if you're interested in joining the Veritas team. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, we've come to the part of the show so many people look forward to uh, in addition to the conversation, but it's, uh, it's listener question time. So I got this email in this week, Excellency, so I'll just, I'll just read it to you. It says, Dear Steve, I have a question for the bishop. What are his thoughts on healing masses and are healing masses held virtually still valid? Oh, that's a great question. And my answer is going to be very controversial. Um, controversial in this sense. If we remember that our prayer is God's giving us an opportunity to prepare our hearts to receive the gifts he intends to give us, 
not our dialogue with God telling him what we think we need as if he did not need it or did not know it, right? Then healing masses are powerful experiences because many times the people who go to them are disposing their hearts to be healed. In fact, every mass is a healing mass. Every experience of the death and resurrection of Christ brings healing of spirit, mind, and even body. The question is, when we go to Mass, are we disposed? Are we opening ourselves to the gifts God is giving? It's the image in the end. If I put a glass, I've said this to you before, put a glass under a faucet upside down, it will never fill, but the water is coming. <clears throat> so, healing Masses, in my estimation, are no different than any other Mass. But there's a disposition, and my challenge is, why are we not disposed at every time we go to Mass to allow the healing graces of God to come? As for healing Masses virtually, <coughs> again, the same applies to any Mass being offered virtually. It is meant to be a bridge, but it's not an end in itself. That the celebration of Mass desires, invites, and everyone needs to make a full effort to be there present in person to receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, which is the ultimate healing gift. So it's not so much a question of validity. It's a question of it's only a bridge for a while. So if someone were to say, Bishop, therefore, do you not advocate healing masses? The answer to that is no, not at all. Of course I would advocate them. And if they're offered and people help to pray over people, yeah, of course, healing can occur. But to those who don't go to healing masses, healing's available to you too at every Sunday mass if we open our hearts to what God wants to give. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. If you have a question for Bishop Frank, you can send it in on social media or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. And we would like to thank Foundations in Faith. It is a grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization that makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Patrick Donovan, thank you so much for being such an evangelist and an apostle. Thanks for your excellent work at the Institute for Catholic Formation. Um, if listeners want more information or some tools to help them, where should they go? Uh, the website for the Institute is formationreimagined.org. Great. And Patrick, thank you. First of all, thank you for coming on the podcast, because you and I have these conversations all the time. But to do it in this forum, hopefully, will help our listeners to understand what's kind of in the background here and what we're planning in the diocese. But I also want to thank you for your tremendous work, hard work, leadership. You really do do a tremendous job. I'm very, I am delighted and grateful that you are here working this project and working with me on this project because this has generational implications for your children's children if they're still in Connecticut at that point. So I thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Bishop. Yes. Formationreimagined.org. Excellency, before we go, would you please give us your blessing? Absolutely. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come to us, Heavenly Father, with the gift of your Holy Spirit, that all that we have discussed this day may come to fruition in your holy will, that you may bless us in the journey of our faith, that we may come to know and serve you ever more deeply, and bring us one day to the glory of everlasting life. We ask this as we ask all things in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Steve, I will see you next week. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Steve. <laughs>